Hi, everyone. My name is Kirsten, and I'm going to talk to you about the most important things to know about climate change. The scientific evidence that climate change is happening, that it's human caused, and that we must act today to avoid its worst impacts is overwhelming. Yet current policies and actions fall far short of what needs to happen for us to continue to live safely on this planet. In this video, I'm going to talk about this gap between what the science says needs to happen and what current policies and actions can achieve. And I'll talk about how we can close that gap. Let's start with the science. Earth's climate is supported by a process known as the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse gases occur naturally in our atmosphere and they play an important role in regulating the Earth's temperature. When sunlight enters the Earth's atmosphere, some of it is reflected back out into space while the rest of it gets absorbed by the Earth and re-radiated as heat or infrared radiation. Greenhouse gases in our atmosphere trap that heat and keep the earth warm. So greenhouse gases or GHGs are heat trapping gases. And as GHGs increase in our atmosphere, so does the earth's temperature. We can see in this chart what concentrations of the primary greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide or CO2, has been in our atmosphere looking back hundreds of thousands of years using data from ice cores drilled in Greenland and Antarctica. And we can see that for the last 800,000 years, CO2 levels have largely fluctuated between 180 parts per million to 280 parts per million in our atmosphere. This sharp and sudden increase at the end of the graph is where we are today at almost 420 parts per million. This is a significant deviation from hundreds of thousands of years prior and it tracks with a significant increase in carbon intensive human activity since the industrial revolution. So let's look at those sources of the greenhouse gas emissions. Anthropogenic or human caused emissions of greenhouse gases originate from a variety of different activities, ranging from electricity generation to transportation to agriculture. But you can slice and dice this in different ways. If you look at sources that are related to our energy use, energy is the number one contributor to greenhouse gases around the world, making up over three fourths of global GHG emissions. The energy resources we have historically used to keep our lights on and our cars moving have predominantly been very carbon intensive. This is why climate change and carbon intensity is a critical consideration when it comes to our energy systems. The result of the recent increase in GHG emissions uh, in our atmosphere is that the earth is experiencing a changing climate at an unprecedented rate with significant impacts already being felt like human, by, by humans today. So let's talk about those impacts. Since pre-industrial times, uh, global average surface temperatures have increased by about two degrees Fahrenheit or 1.1 degrees Celsius. As a result of these temperature increases, we've seen Arctic and Antarctic sea ice melt at unprecedented rates. We've also seen the sea level rise nearly a foot due to the loss of land-based ice and thermal expansion of the ocean. We've also seen an increase in the severity of extreme weather events, ranging from droughts and heat waves to hurricanes. Let's talk about what all of this actually means for real people in the world. It means more common weather conditions conducive to wildfires, which have been increasingly devastating the Western United States in recent years. It means more frequent hot weather and heat waves that drive up air conditioning demand for those who have air conditioning units and stressing the electricity grid and it creates unbearable conditions for the two thirds of the global population that don't have air conditioning. It means flooding in low lying areas from the coasts of Florida to the island nation of the Maldives that you can see a satellite image of here. Climate change also means the displacement of tens of millions of people each year because they are unable to adapt to the increase in flooding, droughts, hurricanes, and other climate related impacts. So the science tells us that we need to significantly decrease our greenhouse gas emissions in our atmosphere in order to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius and avoid the worst impacts of climate change. As you can see in this chart uh, that shows historical and future potential greenhouse gas emissions in our atmosphere, there is a gap between what the science says needs to happen, uh, the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, temperature rise limitation, which is the green band at the bottom, and the current pledges and actions that are currently in place, the blue and pink bars above. 
So we're not acting fast enough and we need to close this ambition gap in order to keep temperature rise at safe levels. A big part of the challenge with closing this ambition gap is garnering the social and political will to act. We talked about the science of climate change. Now let's talk about why it's so hard to garner the level of social will necessary to act to address climate change. The scientific consensus that climate change is happening and that it's human caused is overwhelming. You rarely see this level of consensus from the scientific community on an issue. Yet public opinion on climate change is not aligned with the scientific community. So we need more effective communication techniques to help people overcome certain human biases that make it hard for them to accept and act on climate change. So individual and behavioral biases are one reason why social will on climate change is challenging to garner. A second reason is because of the equity issues surrounding climate change. We have a limited carbon budget because we need to limit carb uh, warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we have over 200 countries with varying levels of contribution to the problem and different levels of, of ability to adapt to the problem. Um, ongoing international negotiations between countries about acting on climate change have really at their core a fundamental question of who is responsible for limiting greenhouse gas emissions to these safe levels. You could allocate responsibility in the carbon budget in terms of total annual greenhouse gas emissions. If you looked at it on, on, a, on an annual basis, you might conclude that clearly China should act because they are the biggest emitter today. But while China is the largest GHG emitter today on an annual basis, on a per capita basis, that's a per person basis, emissions are really led by Canada, the US, Russia, and Australia. If you looked at it even on a cumulative basis, the US and the EU are the biggest emitters. And, uh, and, and looking at emissions on a cumulative basis is important, uh, given that CO2 is such a long-lived gas staying in our atmosphere for a hundred years or more. Looking forward, developing countries, in particular China and India, will account for the bulk of increases in, green, in, in greenhouse gases. And this is really where inequality and equity issues come into play with climate change. You have countries where significant portions of the population don't have access to electricity. A third of the world still lacks access to reliable energy, largely in the developing world. So, it's challenging if, if the US and the EU are gonna tell those developing countries to rein in greenhouse gas emissions, even though the de developed world is historically the biggest contributor to climate change. Moreover, the hardest hit by climate change are the poorest populations of the world, yet they've contributed the least to climate change in the first place. So questions arise of what responsibility does the rest of the world have to help those countries adapt? These are some of the big questions that have held up progress in international climate negotiations and made it challenging for countries to agree on collective action ambitious enough to address climate change. Finally, let's talk about solutions. We have cost-effective solutions available to us today to address climate change. This was not necessarily the case 10 years ago, but over the past decade, the cost of wind, solar, and batteries have come down dramatically to the point where the cheapest electricity and transportation solutions are the low carbon solution. There are several, several great science-based frameworks and models that show how the world can scale these already cost-effective solutions to achieve its climate goals. Um, and one such framework is by Project Drawdown, which laid out the solutions that you can see in this pie chart. Uh, the exponential roadmap is another example of a framework. So, these frameworks tell us that we really need to focus on scaling these already available decarbonization solutions um, and maybe innovating in a few other hard to abate areas like air and marine transport, industrial process heat, and carbon capture technologies. We are already seeing lots of progress happening today to address climate change. Although it may not seem like it at times, there is a lot of momentum and, and, and cause for optimism. We are seeing significant growth in wind and solar power at faster rates than most forecasters could have imagined. We're seeing the decarbonization of the world's transportation sector with the rapid deployment of electric vehicles and other zero emission vehicles. And we are seeing governments take aggressive action on climate change, including put by putting a price on carbon dioxide emissions. 
Carbon dioxide emissions have an external cost associated with them that typically is not priced into the cost of the goods and services that we buy. This is known as the social cost of carbon. So putting a price on carbon, for example, through a carbon tax or a cap and trade mechanism can help correct that market inefficiency by ensuring that the price paid for a good or service reflects the true cost to society. And in so doing, it can also accelerate climate solutions. In instances where a carbon price is maybe politically infeasible, like in the US at the federal level, we've seen uh, governments push forward other policy solutions to address climate change. In August 2022, most notably, the US put in place landmark legislation called the Inflation Reduction Act that provides nearly $400 billion in incentives for clean energy and low carbon solutions. The Inflation Reduction Act has the potential to cut U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by an estimated 40% by 2030, um, enabling the U.S. to make significant progress towards its 2030 goal of cutting emissions in half. And so this is a big deal for, for the world's second biggest greenhouse gas emitter on an annual basis. In addition to policy action at the federal level, we've seen many U.S. states put in place really aggressive targets for procuring clean and renewable electricity, including these 15 states highlighted on this map. The private sector, too, is taking action. We've seen significant shifts in where investment flows are going, um, with global investments in cleaner forms of energy starting to rival global investments in fossil fuels. Let's end by talking about what you can do as an individual. There are certainly a variety of actions you could take to reduce your individual carbon footprint, and I encourage you to consider those. But it's also good to keep perspective on your own carbon footprint. The actions of any one individual alone cannot put a meaningful dent in addressing climate change. So I challenge you to take a step back, make the problem bigger, and really look at the levers that you have available to you to, to have an impact from how you vote to how you engage with the corporations and institutions that you work for, to how you engage socially and, and philanthropically. So we know that we have to decarbonize our economy in order to stabilize temperatures at safe levels on this planet. The science tells us that inaction is not an option. So we all have the opportunity to decide what role we play in driving that decarbonization, whether personally, professionally, politically, or socially. If you'd like to learn more about energy and climate change, be sure to visit our Understand Energy website. Thank you.